Hey guys, it's Jason Snavely, certified wildlife biologist and founder and president of Drop Time Wildlife Consulting, the Drop Time Seed Company, and of course, Drop Time Podcast. Guys, I've uh, 17 years private wildlife consultant, uh, graduated from Mississippi State University. All right, as I'm pushing buttons and stuff. What we're doing is traveling the country. Welcome back, everybody. I wanted to do a podcast. Uh, I've been recording a lot of podcasts, actually. Um, longer form deep dive stuff and that's why I haven't had anything here somewhat recent this one uh, I've been wanting to do for a few weeks now with all the chatter about the dry weather the drought whatever you want to call it and then a client from Missouri yesterday who is a very good deer manager um, and property manager sent me a text and said hey good time to do a podcast about how to manage a drought, how to win against a drought, and the importance of everything that we are doing uh, by what, you know, by that, what he meant was obviously no-till, diversity, regenerative, focusing on soil health, the whole nine yards. So instead of me sitting here just talking like I tend to do for a living, I thought I would have my buddy David Kleinschmidt on. And uh, you there, David? Yeah. All right. I know you're driving as always, so if I lose you at any point in time, which I already lost you there a minute ago when we were chatting, I'll just keep babbling myself till you come back. And I know you're out playing with some trials and taking some plant tissue samples, etc. So I wanted to have you on because um, I always enjoy your agronomic context, but it always applies to to doing what we're doing, I think, for a number of reasons. Uh, your clients obviously need to make money off of <laughs> the plants they grow, and uh, our cash crop is is a big old mature whitetail buck, which I personally think is cooler and better, but uh, a lot of similarities. So I just want to I want to start off with a story, if that's okay. Go ahead and do your stuff. I know you're getting to a field or whatever. Um, but, you know, I've been running around to different properties and talking to clients in all these different regions. And when you look at the U.S. Drought Monitor, I think it's droughtmonitor.unl.edu, you've got, you know, regions where there's none, meaning no drought, and then, you know, runs the whole range, abnormally dry, moderately drought, or moderate drought, severe drought, extreme drought, and exceptional drought, which there are some people in a region of the Corn Belt. Uh, that are in that exceptional drought, and that's that's pretty shitty. That's bad. Um, so anyway, I wanted to talk briefly about this this observation that I personally made on a property. I went to a a new property. Um, well, the first time I was on the property, but I had been working with the client via phone and email and text for for a while. Columbia County, New York. I live in Columbia County, Pennsylvania. So from one Columbia County to the other, beautiful uh, country, east, eastern New York. And by the way, there's a pile of regenerative and organic farmers in that area. And we actually had dinner at, an, at a regenerative restaurant, which was fantastic. So anyway, this particular client, I took my soul talker with me, David, which you'll appreciate. Um, you mean the ST-1? Yeah, ST-1, the, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. tool that has a million names. It's kind of like, like Neon <laughs> Deion Sanders back when he actually played football. He had all those nicknames. The thing has more nicknames than Deion Sanders. So I took that, and, you know, generally I get readings depending on their management and, you know, where we go. But you know this, 1,000, maybe 2,000, depending on – it's dry. It's, it's very dry. That part of the country – was uh, still is sort of, but was big dairy country, and this particular farm uh, was was a dairy farm. But it's been, gosh, we were he was trying to figure it out. It's been easily over fifty to eighty years. I know that's a broad range, but it's been a while since animal impact or, or large animal integration. But as I was telling him, biology is resilient, and. The key to me was the management in the interim. So in other words, the cows leave and what happened in the meantime, you could see when I got to the landscape and tried to start reading the landscape, I could tell that all of the same cattle forages that were planted back then 
were afforded the opportunity to proliferate in the interim. And it was, it was super cool. Bird's foot trefoil, red clover. Uh, there was some ladino here and there that someone else, who, know, who knows where it came from. And then obviously a boatload of grasses that, you know, just came up in the seed bank. And some of the most beautiful, you know, th th this is rolling topography. I mean, some areas where you would actually consider maybe not planting it just for safety. So, you know, this isn't perfectly flat ground. But... It was maintained in these perennial pastures, if you will. So um, I had told the client, since I couldn't get there early enough, to just go into some of them, not all of them, some of them, and scalp it. Mow it super, super low. Um, we ended up scoring a really good deal, or he did, on a, a drill, a no-till drill. Uh, Great Plains, actually. And he then got – he wasn't – he's not a farmer, Um uh, by training, so he got some help from a local farmer, which was was nice. And they, 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 again, scalped it with the mower and then just basically drilled summer reload right into this, this field or these fields. And one of the first things he wanted to do was go look at this and see what, you know, is, is anything coming up, he said, and, and was this worth it? So we get out in this one field, and I'm like, wow, look at this. See, I mean, you know, many of my clients – do not like chemicals. They do not like tillage. So we use the mower and, you know, the drought gives it, when you work with nature, there are benefits to a dry period, right? So we can scalp it. And obviously you've got a period of time where you can get, you can get some plants in the ground. So anyway, he scalped it, but you have to keep in mind contextually that, that there's a root system under the ground that's pretty massive, so you've got this interconnected, you know, all these plants doing their thing, swapping moisture, swapping nutrients. Um, the drill job was, was pretty damn good based on what I saw. And the, the diversity, so there's 15 different species in Summer Reload. No, you do not always see them. Actually, most of the time you only see 7 to 10 or something, you know, something along that lines. We counted almost every species. Now, they were just, you know, only a couple inches tall, popping up through, along with regrowing trefoil, clover, and, and grasses. It was one of the most beautiful sights I'd ever seen. And I was like, he's like, I want to show you this other, this other field. So we ran to the other field, and I jumped out, and it, even better. And this field is in this beautiful rolling landscape in the middle of the mountain range, and I'm like, I got to get in the back of, of the, uh, I forget what he had, a John Deere or Polaris, whatever, and get the ST1, get the soil talker. I've got to see what this is reading. And it was dry, again, very dry. So I stick it in the ground, and instantly the thing takes off, and I'm like, wow, we're going to max this out at 10,000 parts per million. We got up to 91, 64, or 74. It was just shy of the 10,000 max for that particular sensor. And I was like, holy crap, you're looking at over 100 pounds of organic free nitrogen in this field. And the first thing he said was, I could grow corn. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I was like, this is awesome. I mean, for, for those of my clients listening who do the same thing, and I do it too, we got scalp existing fields because we don't want to burn them down with chemical and drill in. You know that it's, you know, it's an art. It's a bit of, there's a lot of luck involved and a lot of what nature throws at you. So anyway, I just wanted to share that because here we are in the middle of whether you're in a drought or just a moderately dry period or whatever, the importance, so there was so much going on right there in that field. And I know we talk about the soul talker all the time and the fact that it's an educational tool and we're learning with it. And it was, it was just a, the perfect, um, spark for the conversation in that field with that client to educate him and me really the more I talked the more the more I thought about what was going on in that field versus other fields where you know guys are either starting fresh with summer reload you know spraying burning down or disking lightly or whatever so there there's that I don't know if you have any any comments about what was going on in that field as opposed to what you see, I know you like to tease me. I'm not on social media much. I've gotten on a little bit more. Um, although I got a new phone and I have to re-sign in, I guess, to all my social media accounts. So my daughter was laughing because I haven't been on because of that. So that's perfect for me. But 
what what do you see when you jump on these food platforms and you're always ribbing at me, sending me screenshots? <laughs> um, what 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 worked better in that particular? Whether you call it pasture cropping or relay cropping or neither, just drilling into a pasture. What else is going on there that I'm not thinking of? It kind of reminds me of the work Dr. David Johnson was doing with the Johnson 2 bioreactor. And full disclaimer, I mean, I've seen it probably fail as many times as it works for guys, you know, who are trying to cut their inputs. But I think what it does do is help to inoculate some soils with some sort of more diverse microbiology and everything. And and what he was showing is, you know, in in, in really just potted, I think they were pepper plants and he was looking at germination bigger of these, these seeds when he planted them with commercial fertilizer versus higher fungal to bacteria ratios. And he actually had greater, uh, quicker emergence and greater amount of above ground biomass basically, uh, with, uh, the, the higher fungal to bacteria ratio soil if you will the potting soil the inoculated soils with his uh, compost tea extract whatever and i think in that situation you, you put the st1 in and, and you you saw that shoot up to 9100 parts per million that you have so much going on in that soil even though it was dry that it allowed for a lot of those species to quickly germinate and express themselves because of that beneficial relationship. Um, in agriculture, we'll sit there and we'll put fertilizer on and, you know, especially guys that will have like a pop-up fertilizer on their planter where they're, they're dribbling fertilizer in with the seed or off to the side. And if a row plugs up, visually you can see that. And, you know, that's a in, in row crop agriculture. We look at that and say, oh, my gosh, you know, this is why we, we have to have this, you know, um, on there. But could we do the same thing with uh, some type of incre- some type of uh, compost tea, maybe increasing that biological activity? Absolutely. Probably um, not. Like I said, I have more. Well, a lot of guys use that. Um, you know, the Johnson Sioux bioreactor, tea, compost, whatever, is they're trying to use it to cut back on inputs, <laughs> specifically nitrogen. And at the end of the day, it's, it, it's been kind of a wash. Um, I think it works a lot better for the guys out in more arid envi- environments and more humid just because we can – we, we generally will get timely rains, which generally are waking up that biology in that soil. We keep things going pretty actively. Uh, but then again, I think on some of these fields that have been, you know, 80 years worth of, of pesticides and um, fertilizers, high rates of fertilizers and longer than that of tillage, that we have disrupted a lot of that. Uh, microbiome in that that soil and we don't get that bigger we don't see what you're seeing and and ironically enough i'm sitting in an area of a farmer's field here and he's got grain bin site here and a couple years ago um this was a soybean field and we flew on a cover crop and we got kind of a poor stand of cover crop in the field but around the field edges and in the rocks between the grain bins where the, the plane flew over, we have had a better stand of cover crop there than we did in the field. And it, it, there's a dirt pile here that the plane flew over. And even this year, there was a stand of hairy vetch and stuff on that better than we had in the field. So how much disruption have we caused? How much carryover with the, the, the herbicides and everything? Uh, could be there how much disruption did we do to that microbiome that's not allowing us to have those species fully express themselves yeah for Um, sure for sure when i dug into that soil i'm I'm thinking biologically active myself as i'm obviously it's hitting over nine thousand parts per million which is really really good 
and it was dry, I'm thinking to myself, the biology limped this soil along. I got to see what it looks like. And of course, I had my spade. Client had his spade. And we started digging, and I pulled. And you instantly saw soil aggregates, stability. And it was, it was just so cool because most of the time when I hit a property um, from you know, a client, this particular client, uh, well, the whole family is physicians who eat amazingly clean and seek to essentially restore ecosystem function to this farm, which is an amazing goal, I think, and kill deer, turkeys, whatever along the way. And it, it was just exciting to see that, um, you know, especially as of late. When I'm getting calls and going elsewhere, and um, and things are are struggling to say the least. So I want to talk about. Obviously, that's another Rick Haney instant or moment there where plants fix dirt, and the plants allowed that particular soil to maintain resilience through the entire. Whether it's I don't know I don't know if they're in a drought. I think they're probably pretty close to a technical drought, um, but. I want to talk about how important is it, I guess, both in your world and in wildlife, um, to maintain living cover on the soil surface. I know when I started, I remember buying my crimper and the crimper got muddy. And I remember making a goal that I never wanted to see that soil surface again. So for three years, maybe four years, and I actually still do it in spots now, um, My if I saw naked soil it didn't matter what month it was I drilled something in it or I even got to the point where I would hand broadcast just to cover that soil so going into a drought like this how important is it to have living cover living cover on the soil surface well it can kind of be twofold a little bit um the living cover is what is building your aggregates. And when we talk about soil health or whatever, the ultimate goal should be to increase aggregate stability. That's going to increase your nutrient cycling. That's going to increase your water cycling. That's going to influence the amount of carbon that's being exchanged in the soil and, and released as CO2. Um, that's really important. If Man, Jason, if I don't know where to get start with this one, but no, because I was going to interrupt you on aggregate stability in case the listener doesn't know what that means. As an example, Rick and I, Dr. Haney and I, took a tube that we use for the ST1, and I keep I have one sitting here in my office that I need to send to you, and we put different holes in the tube, and a lot of people have seen this the ring test infiltration test that the USDA or NRCS, whoever does. And I th- I, I don't know. I kind of thought that was silly. It's cute and I get it, but I thought it was silly when I did it um, at David Brandt's farm. And it, again, is in context, it's kind of relatively neat, but Rick and I said, what if we can let the, the microbes tell us what they think about aggregate stability? So anyway, we put this different tube in the ground, soaked it with our own rainwater and studied CO2 <clears throat> and then we studied it before and after, basically, and said, you know, said, let's see how many inches of rain these microbes in this particular soil can handle and see how long they can they can respire, put off CO2 before we can make it an anaerobic, essentially, scenario. So what do you mean by aggregate stability? That, that to me, that yeah. was that, that was an aggregate stability test, in my opinion. Not And Rick agreed. Actually, Rick was the one who first said, this isn't an infiltration test. This is an aggregate stability test. And that's far more important than those than, than an infiltration test. Right. So when we talk about aggregates, we're talking about the lumps and clumps of that soil and how stable they are, especially wet aggregate stability. So those aggregates are formed by the, the micro aggregates, really, really small ones that you rub in your finger and you just barely feel them. Those are those are formed by by the bacteria. And the large ones that we see, especially around the roots and all, those are formed by the fungi component of that soil. And so we need the, those big ones and we need the small ones. And so a lot of times you're going to look at the soil and you're going to say, well, that's porosity. And 
what we're looking for with that aggregate is when water, when it rains water, which it normally does, right? We want those pore spaces there in that soil so water infiltrates, fills up those pore spaces, and can go deeper into that soil profile rather than just hitting those pore spaces, collapsing them because there's no structure to them or hits the surface, collapses it, and then the water runs off. We want it to go into that sto- soil so we can maintain that balance between that, that solid and the, and the air, basically, so it, in that pore space. So what you're and, saying is not all aggregates are created equal. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can go up to like central Illinois soils that have been worked and they would appear to be aggregated, but really it, if you pour a bottle of water on them, they just turn to sloppy mud. Right. Um, and, and it's the, uh, the roots with the biology, the living roots with the biology that, that help form those, those stable aggregates. The cool thing about that roller cramper is when you get that that armor on that residue or that residue on that soil surface, now that that residue is right in contact with the microbes that's helping to maintain temperature in that soil surface, it's slowing down the evaporation. When it does rain, it's going to hit that and slowly go down into that soil profile and slowly infiltrate into it. But as those microbes are are starting to decompose that that residue on that surface, they start to form that aggregation of that soil at the surface level. And over time, like I tell a lot of guys, it's like making a lasagna or a pizza or whatever. You, you start layering crop residues on top of crop residue on top of crop residues. And, and what we're doing is we're building that soil from the top down, you know, yeah. Um, the roots are doing a fantastic job through, hey, photosynthesis, uh, well, except when you get these uh, Canadian wildfires, somebody needs to get control of those. You know, that's obviously slowing down some photosynthesis, but with the photosynthesis, it's all about, you know, creating sugars in that plant and taking those sugars, using those for enzymatic activity in that, in that plant. Um, moving nutrients, cell division, cell expansion, and then also releasing those sugars out of that, that root, feed microbes in exchange for nutrients that the plant can then take up, do the same thing over again, and those microbes in the soil are eating, breeding, and dying all at the same time within hours, within minutes of each other. And so they're releasing CO2, which then the plant is taking up, which is needed for it to make C6, C6, H12O6. So that's so that simple sugar that we're needing through photosynthesis. So it's a pretty cool cycle, but all those parts are kind of needed. But how does that pertain to drought, I guess? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's, I had a, I had a, um, a guy in Texas who bought a soil talker recently say to me i thought this was funny but it's kind of basic but it was funny because we were talking about in depth about drought and and biology and the importance of of our management and he said this drought really has been a reminder in and i thought he's going to give me something really in depth and it turned out to be but on the surface it's kind of funny of of how important rainwater is <laughs> and it and it was so you know most people were like well that's a stupid comment but when you run around with an ST1 and you're testing, you're essentially doing what's done in the Haney, you know, for the Haney in the lab, you know, the, the dry down and rewetting process, you're looking at that in nature in real time, right? The dry down period is just over a six week or four week or seven week, whatever period of drought you had. And then that's why I ran out there as soon as we got a rain the next day and looked at all of my management. And it was struggling, obviously. When I say struggling. Actually, what the biology was doing is it just it just shut down. It just wasn't replicating and reproducing and going to work. And then all of a sudden, when that rain fell, man, it was like, okay, it's time to catch up. And to me, as it's dry, I just sit back and go, all right, what can I be doing when nature gives me drought? Well, scalping some plots, uh, my favorite cover crop. Um, ragweed i don't know if you got that excel spreadsheet i sent you but i love studying 
what's going on with the ragweed on my farm and a couple other weeds, quote unquote weeds, plants that are doing amazing jobs. And, and the thing that, that I thought about when you, you were talking is clients or whatever peers of mine who get into one of these droughts or even during a normal period and they have a grass or a profile of quote unquote invasive grasses, which is funny to me, invasive. But yet, it's the only plant growing where industrialized, mechanical, chemical farming or agriculture or food plotting has destroyed the soil, just beat the hell out of the soil. And these are the only plants growing. And instead of taking a minute to go, wait a minute, maybe I should just stop buying seed and let this plant fix this dirt. They're like, all right, I got to start over. I got to kill all the plants that are actually working and plant your summer reload or some other guy's blend. And I'm like, listen, I don't care if I sell another bag of seed for the rest of my life. The only reason I got into the seed business is because all the other seed companies in the wildlife world um, just didn't get it. So if we can work with nature and use seed that's already in the bank, and I don't care what the NRCS or your state considers it, whether it's invasive or a noxious chemical, quite frankly, most of those people are invasive and noxious to the soil. And they have been for 150 years, along with me, my kind, and my relatives. So let's get off this invasive bullshit, and let's look at the plant for what it is. It's cycling carbon. It's feeding microbes. It's photosynthesizing quite efficiently, by the way, just because you might have been trained in in college that you paid for, unfortunately, that it's a weed or it's out of place or it's whatever it is, it's nonsense. So I'll get off my soapbox, but when you were talking there, it made me think about so many situations where clients have been calling me like, look at this. And I'm like, awesome, in a drought and you got free seed. I don't know who you worship or thank but you better thank him or her right now (laughs) right and it kind of goes back to that story that i I like to do when when uh somebody has a a, what they consider a weed mess in their field and and i say i I tell them to get a mirror and throw it out there and look in the mirror and there's your problem right i mean to me it's not really a problem it's time we get away from just talking to a new client yesterday in wisconsin and we were agreeing, this is, now this is a client who is very much, um, I don't know, 30, 40 years along the management continuum, which is pretty intense, killing great bucks, six and a half year old bucks. And we were talking about the fact that whitetails once ate over 150, maybe more different species. Why are we not letting whitetails be whitetails? Kind of like, you know, the, the cattle guys need to let cattle be cattle. We should just let them be whitetails and get off of this, we've got to have grain, we've got to have grain nonsense, because grains rip up, I know you're going to get uncomfortable right now, but grains in certain amounts to me, both in humans and wildlife, sure, I'll take some, but I think we overdo it, and we screw up the system, so anyway, there's some, some, I had some thoughts that I would interject. (laughs) Yeah, and I think uh, it's kind of ironic. I, I see guys planting a lot of soybeans and a lot of corn for food plots here, and I'm like, we're surrounded by corn and soybeans. So I, I get it late season when everything's harvested and those are still there that the, the deer are going to go to that. And then you got on the other side of the spectrum, you got the guys that are doing all brassicas and all clovers. Yeah. You know? Well, if you want to make big, if you want to grow a big deer, you, you need the energy source with that protein. You know, we, we can't just be focused on one or two things. So no, I agree. You need that diversity and the diversity of plant species. They're also going to feed the diversity of microbes. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, they go hand in hand together there. So perfect. I want to, I'm going to float this out there because I think you were going here before our, our conversation sort of took a different turn. And I want you to talk about, we talked about this, you and I recently on another recording that I've just been thrown in the tank for a longer form podcast on roller crimpers. And that was a great conversation. Um, but that's going to come out later than this particular podcast. <clears throat> so we ran into an issue this year. Farmers ran into the same issue as food plotters. And I'm actually going to go um, I've been drinking a lot of coffee and water, so you can deduce what that means, but I'm going to float the question and then 
let you take over <laughs> uh, for it won't be long. Um, so I want to talk about the trade-off between, you know, obviously it's it's become sexy now to plant green, and this is an explanation when a client I just got an email I get emails all the time with this question: Do you crimp first? And then plant, or do you plant and then crimp? And what they really mean is, are you planting green, letting it go for a couple of weeks, and then crimping it down? Because they see things out of context on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, and they think that that's what they should be doing because some guy's looking for more content on his web show. So can you talk a little bit about, let's say we, we planted the the cool season annuals, right? So I'm, I'm thinking Harry Vetch, um, Triticale, cereal rye, that kind of thing, barley, whatever. And you now get into May and June of 2023 where we're super hot and dry, but we had enough rain. Obviously, you planted them last September or whatever, October. And, you know, the, these rye, um, hairy vetch, winter pea, crimson clover, whatever plots are just are doing pretty damn good because they were allowed to do their thing all winter. Um, early spring, we got some rains, nice weather. But now we hit this massive what's called early season drought i think in your world you know as opposed to a july august drought we get hit with a may june drought and we're trying to decide you and i've had this conversation um okay do i go out there i actually have plant residue living plant on the ground living soils in the in the soil i'm feeding microbes i'm cycling carbon and I've got a, you know, a a pretty decent plant profile of what I want. In other words, most guys would say I don't have a lot of weeds. What's the trade-off between killing it earlier and not, not gaining the biomass production since you already planted it, right? You might as well get the biomass, continue to suck nutrients out of the soil, put them in that organic fraction. But what's the trade-off between the fact that that particular cover crop or whatever plant species is sucking moisture at a time when you know there's pretty serious moisture stress. Does that does that question make sense? So, in other words, yeah. I, I know you you do a lot of studies where you're like, hey, you sent me some some tissue analysis stuff one time or plant plant analysis. You're like, holy crap, look at the difference between and I can't remember. It was like a, the duration was a week or two. You're like, if this mm-hmm. guy would just stop killing or these guys would stop killing their covers so early, burning them down to get their corn in because it's a massive rush to plant a warm season annual, which is silly in and of itself. Look at the extra biomass we added in one week, two weeks, three weeks. Now, obviously, there's a trade-off because as it's growing, it's sucking moisture and nutrients, and your clients are looking to plant a cash crop. I mean, this is what they live for this time of the year, to plant a cash crop. My, My guys and guys like me, are looking to get summer reload, summer nourishment, or some warm season corn beans, whatever, in the field. My biggest concern to you was I need to I need to work with nature here. If if it's not giving us rain in June, May, June, who cares? I'll plant my warm season in July, or I'll plant a shorter window plant in that time period, or I'll plant my fall stuff early and let this let this realize. So can you kind of talk about that? at least in your world. And I know, you know, enough about food plots to, to, you know, should I, I did half and half. I, I always, when a client calls and says, which one should I do? I'm like, you need to know my goal is to teach you. So you don't need me. Cause there's a lot of people who need teached. I know that's not a word. So you go ahead. There's a, there's a whole lot just right there to, to I unravel. Know, I said I had I to mean, make a scrape. That's why I floated that out. There. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a scrape as you talk about that. Go ahead. I'm still here though. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Just don't ask me a question in the next, you know, thirty yeah, seconds. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Looking at it, like you got to think about the weather. Basically, a, a farmer or a food plot or whatever, we have to be meteorologists, and we've got to look at the time that we sowed that uh, fall seeded biennial of that cover crop, whether that's rye, clover, oats, barley, whatever. When we seeded that in the fall time and going through the winter time and coming into the springtime, we have to be monitoring our moisture status from the day of seeding till the day we think about terminating or when we're going to plant that next plant species. 
in a lot of my areas this year, we were fairly dry last fall, fairly dry all winter. We caught some spring rains, but we are literally in the last three months, we're anywhere from five inches behind last year to 13 inches behind. Uh, and, and I'm talking about kind of central to southern Illinois, out across Missouri, uh, towards Kansas City. So especially when you get out to, towards Kansas City, you get into a D3 drought area where you're 11, 12, 13 inches behind last year's rainfall, you got to kind of make that determination of what are we going to do? Well, for us farmers, row cropping, if we allow that cover crop to continue to sit out there and suck up moisture, yeah, we can increase the biomass, but we don't have a crystal ball that's going to tell us, hey, it's going to rain in two weeks. It's going to rain, you know, this time throughout the summer. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big gamble that we're doing here. But if we go out there and terminate, manage for our moisture that we've had, and we, we terminate early, we could probably get a better stand establishment of our corn or our soybeans that we're going to plant like this year. If we waited two weeks, we're probably going to have a lot more biomass. We're going to have a lot more nutrients, almost double the amount of nutrients in that biomass. So we can take credit for that. So we don't have to write the check for the big fertilizer bill, which is awesome. But we gave up moisture and moisture is such a critical part of this whole farming equation. I don't care if it's food plot or whatever, we're just farmers here and we're planting the seed. We're wanting something to grow. Gardeners, farmers, we're all the same. And moisture is a huge critical piece of this. You know, to get the nutrients to cycle in the soil, it's going to take moisture. To get a residual herbicide to work, it's going to take moisture. I'm looking at crops that are showing a ton of potassium deficiencies. Oh, and by the way, it's also showing manganese deficiency. You know, manganese helps regulate that potassium up and down that plant. Well, if we don't have the moisture to allow those clays to swell and shrink, and that swelling and shrinking releases potassium out of that clay, we're going to be deficient of, of potassium. The cereal, I'm looking at a soybean field right now. It had cereal rye in it. There's a ton of potassium in that cereal rye, but it is not being mineralized back out because we have not had the rainfall. So the, the bean crop is showing some deficiencies there. Now I say that, and we had an inch and a half of rain yesterday, which is great. But you didn't have to go very far, and and people didn't have any rain. You know, forty miles to the south of me had zero. So those guys have been hurting. You know, it doesn't really matter. Then we can talk about it all day long. But for us, for us row croppers, our our goal is to still harvest a crop. You know, so we have to do the right things at the right time to still be able to manage a crop. To put this in this one year and say, well, this is the way it's going to be. And it's just, you know, I'm going to terminate early over here. Well, you terminate it early and all of a sudden we get uh, a rain period that lasts for 30 days. And you've got brown residue out there. You're not going to get planted at the end of that 30 days for another maybe two weeks or longer as we wait for that soil to try to dry out. So we don't have sidewall compaction and we don't rut it up, you know, so there's some trade offs there. We just have to be so patient and so flexible with it. Um, yeah. No, that's, yeah. That's, that's, I'm back. I didn't want to let you ramble there. Um, <laughs> doesn't take me that long. Uh, so so this, this reminds me of uh, the whole plant and green and people asking, you know, I'm going to buy a roller crimper. You know, I love the fact that it saves time. And I saw so-and-so with it on the front. But... I and like when this year we were super dry and I waited and waited and waited and I realized okay there are some chances of some decent thunderstorms some showers some rain coming so I'm gonna just for curiosity put like an acre in just plant green and leave it go and see what happens and then I'm gonna crimp terminate some and drill in these are these are monoculture soybeans just strips nothing major before I get all the emails and I do like organic beans, by the way, for hunting from a hunting standpoint. Um, and the difference was actually 
not surprising at all. And then I got, we got, we got rain and we had plenty more coming. And I was like, okay, now if, if I could show my clients and the people who asked me, now is when I'm sticking my crimper on the front for two reasons. I had rain. I've got moisture in the soil. I dig down pretty shallow. I've got a lot of moisture. Keep in mind, I have living cover. I have plant residue on the surface and I'm building soil on the top. I stick the crimper on the front and the summer reload and summer nourishment in the drill. And I'm crimping and planting at the same time. It makes total sense. I do not want to come back later and crimp that. But the cool thing is I had soil moisture in the ground. I laid that massive mat down on top of my seed and retained that moisture. Then we got, we finally got the moisture we'd been waiting for. Quite a bit of rain, actually. And that stuff germinated, took off out of the ground. And within, I mean, days, when those microbes start working in that rain event, within days, the growth on that was far better than the stuff I had planted weeks earlier and, and left. Again, when you're planting green, you're still killing a lot. I mean, the deer like, don't get me wrong, the deer were pouring in that, fo- that field because the beans were popping up and... You know, not you don't crimp terminate everything. This is a whole nother contextual issue with crimp terminate. This guy says, Well, I didn't I didn't get it all. I need to go kill. No, you don't need to kill it. Hell, I'll even take ragweed popping up at a threshold because it's it's helping the existing plants. It's also protecting the existing or the the new uh, soybeans that are popping so the deer don't just devour. It makes them work, right? Cr- critters don't mind working. They're not like Americans or humans in general. They don't mind working for their food. And I personally like to make them work for their food. It spreads out their dung and their urine and, it, and the hoof action all over my fields. I would rather see them just basically ramble around the field looking for what they want at that moment. And so so anyway, Penn State at the same time, which is only an hour and a half-ish west of me. Um, i trying to think of the guy's name. I think it's John Wallace if I'm not mistaken, over at Penn State, they did some soybeans into a lot of plant residue. They planted green. They planted on the same day and they planted green on, you know, one of their trial plots. And then they did basically a conventional terminate at the same time. And the difference in termination was, was mind blowing. Like their soybeans, again, planted same day. Soybeans, when they terminated it, are exponentially taller and look better because of, you know, there's obviously not the moisture stress than if they left the cover crop go. So I'm not saying planting, I love planting green. I know Rick Clark, um, who also has an ST1 out there in Indiana, plants a pile of organic soybeans, is a big fan of planting green. I'm just trying to get across the idea that it's fun and sexy to watch some web show and some guys digging for content, right? Some guy who just... A couple years ago was planting a monoculture GMO soybean because that's who paid him, but he ran out of content and in fear of becoming irrelevant, he had to go to a new route and now he's talking about planting green like he invented it. Understand that there is a context, there's a time and a place for that and I like to dig deeper into each topic with guys like you and get out in the field and say, okay, when does this work and when doesn't this work? You agree? Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because as I'm looking at fields and seeing where guys maybe either planted and let the rye and the beans grow together, if they didn't have a, a crimper, you know, they they sprayed it out about the time it hit flag leaves. Um, the beans were up and everything, but it, at their comfort level, just starting with cover crops and all, that's when they terminated the the cereal rye and and it was only planted at like 45 pounds per acre and it was broadcast um spread so it wasn't like a consistent drill um drilled a rate you know but one thing i noticed is that in his sprayer tracks where he had knocked down that rye versus right next to it where the rye was standing I pulled up bean plants and was just looking at the overall height of the bean and looking at the node spacing. And the beans were just at the top right now, of that flag leaf rye. And of course, we hadn't had any rain to really knock that 
that rye down. So the soybean has been competing against that cereal rye for sunlight for the last 45 days or longer. And that bean was taller, but it had like four less trifoliates on it. By trifoliates, I mean you got the main stem, you got a petiole that goes off of it, and then you got these three leaves that are attached to each one of those petioles. Mm -hmm. That's a trifoliate. So when I get to talking about roller crimping a standing bean and I say trifoliate, know what I'm talking about. And anyway, so it had three or four less trifoliates on it than the bean right next to it in the sprayer track. The one in the sprayer track also, each one of those tr uh, petioles was spaced about a half inch apart going up that stem. In the rye, it was about an inch and a half apart. Wow. So for grain production, each one of those trifoliates will feed 50% of the nutrient needs to that cluster of beans that is attached to that, that stem at the end of the petiole. Or that, yeah, the petiole. The other 50% comes from um, above and below. So 25% comes from above, 25% comes from below. Um, from that trifoliate from above and below, right? And so the greater the distance in that internode on that plant, the more energy it takes for that plant to move nutrients up and down that stem to feed a cluster of beans. We shorten them up, we stack those nodes up. Now we've got more beans on that plant we've got that we can feed. So as we're sitting out here and talking about this, you know, we can grow those soybeans into standing rye, plant them, and then come back later and roller cramp terminate. But you want to be at V2, so two trifoliate leaves. That's about the max you want to roll cramp those beans. And by that time, when we roll them, those beans are pretty washy. Like they're, they're trying to compete with that sunlight. So they're tall, they're lanky, they're kind of spindly. They're real rubbery. You roll them over and they'll pop right back up within a couple days. And they might have a little gooseneck to their stem. But overall, they will start stacking the nodes right on top of each other and bushing out really good. So I do like that. I like it for seven and a half inch drilled beans. I like it for 10 inch drilled beans, uh, 15 inch planted beans, 20 inch planted beans. Okay. 30 inch beans. If you're going to plant with a planter. I would recommend going, uh, if you're going to roll and crimp it that way, you either make sure that your tire on your tractor is not running over a row um, or roll it at a slight angle, like two degree angle. Mm -hmm. The other problem is, is that I've been on fields here this, this spring. Guys rolled in crimp beans and they said it was a second trifoliate. And I get out there three weeks <laughs> after they rolled it and they're like, well, I rolled it the second trifoliate. The beans were just now getting to second tri to V2, second trifoliate, you know. What they were seeing is the first leaf that comes up, that waxy leaf, the cotyledon leaf, that's VC. That's not a trifoliate. Yeah. The next leaf that comes out has got a petiole attached to it. It's an oval-shaped leaf. Um, and that's what we call the unifoliate. The next set of leaves that come out are the first trifoliates. So that's V1. The second set of trifoliates that come out would be V2. So when we go that's and we roller crimp. That's where you want to crimp. That is where we want to crimp. If we go too early and we knock off both of those petioles, that bean plant's done. It can live with one petiole. Or I'm sorry, back up. We knock off those cotyledons, cotyledon, not yeah. petioles. Yeah. yeah. So we knock off one codling, and that bean can survive. We knock off two, that bean's done at that stage. So knowing when to crimp is pretty darn important on, on, on timing. Um, and, and the rye stage, too. I mean, and we talk about this in that other podcast. I hate to ruin too much of it, <laughs> but just making sure that that rye's at the right stage. Now, let's flip over to corn for a little bit. If we were to plant corn into something green or milo or sorghum or whatever, that C4 grass, we plant it into a living cover crop and we allow it to grow together. 
corn is a very weak grass and so is the sorghums as well in this aspect of when it emerges and it has green vegetation against it, it kind of turns into a little bit of a weakling yep. because of the, 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 the light wavelengths that are being reflected off of that green vegetation that that plant is then absorbing. So we, I like to have, when I'm planting like a corn or a milo or something like that, roll that cover crop down and get it killed off as soon as possible so that when the corn comes up or the milo comes up, it's brown next to it. It's just like the soil. And you don't have that, you know, the wavelengths being reflect wavelengths being reflected off of that that cause issues early on. Where that's mainly for row crop. You know, mm -hmm. on the food plot guys, you probably can get by with it. Here's the other thing is last night me and Buddy in Southern Illinois were talking. He sent me some pictures. And his he didn't have really – he plants in late May into a big old stand of cover crop every year. I mean, it's it's wicked. Plants – are you Please. talking corn or beans or both? Corn. Okay. Well, both really. But his corn, he waits until the end of May, uh, at least middle to end of May, so he can get wow. the most amount of nutrient out of that How's he do that, that when the neighborhood's crop. not doing that? <laughs> I figured it out actually. He doesn't start working on his planter until like April's and then it takes, <laughs> you know, pressure off. His planter's not ready. There you go. That's good. <laughs> At least that's what I joke with him about, right? I'm sure he's so, a little bit smarter than that. Yeah, yeah. He uh he gets to planting at that time. You know, last year was kind of the same as this year. And in southern Illinois I always say we're two weeks from a drought. And so that corn was spindly, it just it looked anemic. And he didn't really get any rain until July 7th last year. And that corn, just like this year, corn into a cover crop in a dry conditions anywhere, when it's sitting there in dry and it's trying to transition from V4 to V5, and that's about the time that it stops living off the seed and it starts to fully live off those roots, that's the ugly period of corn growing. I mean, for for a cattle guy, if we're if we're uh, raising replacement heifers from that six hundred pound to eight hundred pound, there's days that you go out there and you're gonna like, be like, man, these girls are ugly. I'm gonna <laughs> take them all to the cell barn. And, okay, it, back up, guys that don't know cattle. Remember in junior high when there was a girl that you thought when spring break hit, you're like, boy, she's not that good looking at all. <laughs> and uh, then you come back that next fall and you're like, holy cow, what happened to her? She's pretty now. Yeah. Uh, she got they go v through that. She got beyond V4? Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah, she got beyond V4. Now we're into V5, V6. You know, like, hello. And uh, that's kind of what our corn does. And so when it's really dry, like that corn is just, it's, it's struggling. And so his corn last year was struggling through that V4 to V6 stage. It struggled. It caught rain. Now, of course, he didn't harvest that corn in September, but he, he was harvesting beans earlier, which, I mean, that's part of his whole system. Get the beans off to get the corn cover crop established sooner because you're putting legumes in that system. But where I'm going with all that is his corn yields were 180 bushel an acre on that, which is pretty much the same as the neighbors that were planting a month earlier. <laughs> with a whole lot more inputs yeah i was gonna say but i always say that we are always two weeks from a drought here in southern illinois and so if we have that residue on that soil surface and we catch like two weeks ago we caught it or three weeks ago now we caught an inch of rain and i've got some late planted my corn here up the road that i'm going to do these spray trials on and this week, it was looking pretty rough. When the wind started blowing and it was up to 93, 95 degrees, it was curled up. It was looking pretty tough. But when I was pulling soil samples there on Monday and comparing cover crop ground versus non-cover crop tilled ground, that ground still had moisture in the soil profile. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a lot by any means, but it was still enough to keep that plant going. And generally in this environment, 
we have 85, 95% humidity from the time we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed. Well, this year we've been in 30 and 40% humidity. So this is like Kansas weather. So our crops are a little bit struggling out there and we don't, we're not getting those dews in the morning and everything. So it, that corn is looking pretty tough, but right now after this inch and a half rain, it's going to be, it's going to be able to go on past that V6 stage and live off of that, that moisture in that soil for the next three weeks after we start drying out two to three weeks longer than what the conventional till ground is. That's good stuff. The other thing I wanted to talk about is perennials in this. I know you and I were joking around yesterday and you don't have to disclose our, our jokes and comments um, <laughs> about. So, so whitetails, again, getting back to whitetails and turkeys and, and feeding insects for game birds and then obviously for herbivores, feeding herbivores, uh, which an insect is a herbivore, uh, right? Yeah, just a different size. Anyway, um, so perennials in the system, everybody gets, has gotten caught up in when I started the summer reload, fall reload, spring reload thing, and then a couple others jumped on and came out with their uh, similar copying names, which I think is kind of cool, but God, I don't know. I you know, should name your stuff your own, whatever. So the thought of what happened to perennials, and when I started doing the last couple weeks, some interviews with clients like, okay, you need to be making observations right now because A, this is why we're trying to change our management so 180 degrees, right? Where this is why the stuff we're doing is so seems so crazy because everything we've been doing um, in learning from conventional chemical, whatever, industrialized farmers has been wrong. When you look at the perennial system, it obviously is, has done a lot better. Whether, you know, whether there's a weed, quote unquote, infestation or not, the perennial systems are, it's like, oh, thank God for these right now. Um, and deer, deer obviously seek both annuals and perennials. There's no, that's no secret. But I feel like a lot of people in the last couple of years in the wildlife world, and keep in mind, we're not harvesting crops necessarily, we're feeding forage, have lost track of the perennials and when I created the reload series, I also made a perennial reload and we've done, I bet 15 to 20 different versions of that based on what a client wants or where they're located geographically. And when I start shooting off text emails and phone calls, they're like, Oh my God, thank God. Because my turkeys and my poults are either in my cool season annuals, right? That I didn't crimp or they're in the perennial plots right now. And to me, I think, don't lose track of the perennials. And obviously, that's a completely different context in your world, unless you're talking cattle, sheep, whatever. But I don't know. I just feel like, again, we're, we are restoring ecological function to properties, recreational properties, because deer will, quite frankly, be healthier, be more productive, and ultimately grow larger antlers regardless of what the monoculture, low diversity guys who joke about love in their plow think, right? So any, any comments or, or observations on the yeah. perennial side of things? Well, whether it's, you know, some perennial warm season grasses or cool season introduced species, you know, orchard grass, fescues, things like that. I've got guys that try to not mow the roadsides until – August mm -hmm. and that allows the quail and pheasant a place to go. And we've, we've seen such an explosion of that. And, and even with the, the roller cramping and everything of, well, heck if we got rye that's seeded out or something, we're knocking the seeds to the ground. They're <laughs> loving it. Right. Um, that, that you just, but there's you so just much out a sneak peek on our, on our deep dive on roller crimping, which, I'll talk about that maybe here in a minute. Why we keep bringing that up is that that fallacy of I heard that that um, YouTube channel that somebody sent me. The guy was talking about roller crimping, and my client was like, "Well, shit, 
if this was all I watched, 10 minutes about the roller crimper, I'm pretty sure I'd fail 90% of the time. That was his, <laughs> that was from coming from him. And he's, he was from Georgia, but, um, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. But I mean, we're also creating such a habitat there for so many insects as I'm sitting here on the edge of this field. I mean, I, I'm hearing a lot of crickets and stuff out there. Well, the crickets are granivores. They're going to eat a lot of that seed too, but, yeah. uh, guess what our pheasants and our quail love them yeah and, and i love turkeys too I've, I forget about turkeys. And, and turkeys yes and i love sitting there in the mornings in at my house i could i'll sit out in, in the evening and listen to the quail and the pheasant and uh just just thinking about how heck in in the last few years how much of that population has came back yeah you know um just just because of our management with that I mean, there's, there's old, I said, I want to say old guys, <laughs> guys around here that would say, you know, they grew up hunting quail and rabbits and pheasants and every, every farm had a fence row that they would just walk all winter long, you know, get out of school and go walk the fence row and go shoot quail and pheasant and rabbit and all that. And now there's not a fence row around. We've taken them all out. You know, we just farm it all and then we mow it all because you got to keep it looking sexy for the That's right. whoever, um, yep. land managers or whatever. Yeah, all of our but farmers those, do the same thing. If there's just a field next to the road, even if it's, you know, three quarters of an acre, I've got one here by me alongside a stream. The most beautiful, you know, habitat for a, a hen turkey to drag her poults through the field, down to the creek up into the timber stand it's just perfect and they mow it every year and it drives me crazy i'm like man the you know i don't know if it, like milkweed for instance if you look at a native um, seed company and try to buy a few pounds of milkweed i know this sounds crazy but they're selling it for astronomical prices and we get a field full of milkweed and and 15 to 30 other different species and they're mowing it. It just drives me yep. crazy, but I get the same issue. Like on my farm, my wife's the same way, and clients tell me, you know, they're the same way. They like to have, like you said, roadsides, you know, for the visitors because it's all about people who come visit us. That's that's my argument with my wife. Like I don't give a damn what the UPS guy thinks about my fields along my driveway, right? I like to personally go out in the morning because every morning, by the way, this is something I've been doing, every morning 20 minutes you got to get at least 20 minutes of natural daylight every morning before looking at that stupid phone or TV or whatever blue light crap you look at. It's awesome. But I love to go out and take note of, of what stage my weeds are in, which really is pollinators for me, and they're all weeds, yes. The deer are in them, the turkeys are in them. Um, the songbirds, dicky birds, whatever you call them, are everywhere. It drives me nuts when people mow stuff like that. Oh, bees. I'll throw that out there. Sorry, you hit a nerve. No, that's fine. The, um, the, but, but even that, I mean, perennials versus annuals, their roots are going down a heck of a lot deeper, right? Yeah. So they're able to withstand the drought periods a lot longer than what our annuals are as well. And even the, the constant mowing, I, I was up in central Illinois yesterday and because of, I guess, peers, uh, pressure from other farmers and land managers and, and afraid of losing rents or whatever. I mean, these guys, they were bat winging the, the road ditch. And then on another side road, they had two, uh, uh, zero turn mowers mowing and all i could see was dust like yeah. they there wasn't even grass that they were hardly mowing they're just kicking up dust mm -hmm. and i'm like why because it's such a waste of time a waste of energy it's a calendar year i've asked the farmers around here why are you mowing right now when fawns are on the ground poults are on the ground and it's a calendar they're all like oh i, I do every year on june 15th they're you know roughly 18th 19th 16th when it's not raining i mow and i'm like Jesus. They ain't got nothing else to do between now and when they go to the lake. I guess. I guess. But, yeah. But you're right. If you think about the growth cycle of an annual versus a perennial, a perennial, you know, it's frustrating when we plant our alfalfa, perennial clovers, or whatever you're planting grasses, because that first year, you know, you get the weeds and everybody gets mad. And it cracks me up like with native warm season grasses. They're planting the switchgrass and 
they they plow it because they got nothing year one. Those those perennials are doing what perennials do, and they're establishing a root base because they're in it for the long run, right? Yeah. The annuals are like, oh crap, I got I've got to take the conditions Mother Nature's giving me right now, grow super fast, a little bit of you know roots enough to hold me up stable, and then I've got to go to seed head and mature really quick, throw seeds because I'm gonna die, right? I'm basically yeah. gonna you know that's what's gonna happen, so. When you think about being in that rushed scenario, um, gosh, you throw a drought at an annual, it's a stressful situation. You throw a drought at a perennial, like you said, they can sit through that, especially if they're intertwined with other perennials of different plant functional groups. They don't give a damn. And the cool thing is all along the way, the deer's still eating them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the things I noticed a couple of years ago is like, some farmers that were holding off until that August or even September, October, once they started harvesting, they'd put somebody on the mower after that, you know, yeah. and the amount of big blue stem that we were getting in the roadside. So I'm like, where'd that come from? Mm-hmm. Right. We didn't see that. It, obviously it was there, but by mowing it every couple of weeks or every month, we were suppressing it out, not letting it go to seed head. I tell, I tell grazers the same thing, you know, quit grazing every 30 45 days or 60 days take an area and just let it rest for an entire year and see what grows yes yeah you might get some brush that grows in there too some some locust or some buck brush or something but you'll start to see some different grass species that you didn't know you had that reminds that's me that's funny that reminds me of a project i did here called a project um my academician peers would say it's just a junk project but I, I electric fenced an area um, that I didn't do anything to. I didn't plant. I just left it go. So I couldn't go in it. The deer um, didn't really go in. Well, I don't think they went in it at all. And, you know, obviously some birds, you know, from above dropped in. And I'm sure some rabbits snuck in. But just to see what the species, what the, what the, the I call it the signature of the land, what the profile of the plant uh, the plants that, that realized was, and it was so cool. I didn't have the time. I had the desire sort of, but little projects like that, you know, do you have to tangibly get down on your knees and throw a two by two or a a meter square and count every species? I mean, that's cool if, if, you know, if you're a university, but the power of observation, I think is far greater than, than, uh, you know, science, quote unquote, university science. I walked in there and I was like, wow, tore the fence down and that square for years that was probably seven years ago um that square of of plant species still remains different because of that one year and the flip side of that is one time this was just pure accident i like to admit that i did it but it was just pure accident i painted myself in a corner in my research fields at my barn meaning i planted everything and I was like, oh, crap. I left my corner plot go for my kids to hunt. And I didn't plant it. Now I got to go through everything that's already that already planted. And I was like, you know what? This is kind of silly. I can't get any of my equipment out the back of my barn. I'm just going to mow one strip with my bush hog in, in like a swoosh, the shape of a swoosh, you know, a swoosh, swoosh, whatever it's called. Just a big boomerang out, of, out the back of my barn and then to my, my road access. And I did that, not thinking anything of it. Now I can run my my uh, Polaris Ranger or whatever. And the next year, I was like looking at some of the uh, cool season annual grasses that had come in to that cover crop plot. And I'm like, why are they shaped, these clump grasses, um, orchard grasses, and just other, you know, other species that were nowhere else hardly in this seven-acre field? And it made the exact shape. I talk about, duh. It made the exact shape of of an access route to my barn and I realized that mowing those covers at a time when it was really asinine to do that I just did it for functionality completely changed the plant community and profile of species and actually brought on species that most people would not want and then I ended up using a an organic contact herbicide and spot treating them it was actually another study or trial I did spot treating them 
and I didn't kill all of them, but I killed 50% of them. Um, then left the others as a reminder that everything you do has a footprint or a signature for years to come. And that ties into this whole drought thing. Guys are like, well, I'm on my first year. The, the guys in their first year of transitioning from, you know, lack of diversity and, and tillage and all the chemical cheats that they've been using, this is painful. This is the worst year since probably 1988 to start that. But I think it's going to make them stronger in the long run. Um, but the guys who are only a couple years into the regenerative soil health, you know, transition in food plots, um, this, I'm like, this needs to be a reminder to you of why you're doing this. Right. And that's, I guess that's the ultimate reason I wanted to do this podcast and tying it back is everything you're seeing that is super painful right now. Just understand it doesn't have to be that way. Number one. And number two, nature's a hell of a lot tougher than we are in our modern, everybody gets a trophy society. If, if things stop for a little while, it's, it's okay. Just wait until the engine kicks back on, meaning the rainfall, and start again. Yeah. Yeah, and to even go back to all this, the Tom how drought and everything, and uh, in the cropping and where guys start, man, I tell you what, it wears me out watching some of these guys on everything, cover crops or whatever, on, on Facebook, and they're complaining about their, their corn that they planted into you know rye. <laughs> 90 pounds of cereal rye and <laughs> terminated it later and i'm like what do you expect to happen dude seriously a grass in front of a grass is probably a no to begin with but then you let it you know suck up moisture on the dry year yeah i mean wh- yeah. what do you expect to happen but also one it's okay I- if that was a learning experience and they move forward from it but that that's just- what equally that's why that's you and I share this all the time. You will watch that roller crimping, you know, YouTube thing was the perfect example. And I like to sit back and think, okay, I don't watch that, but clients will share it with me. Like you need to see this so that you can educate people on the right, you know, the facts or, or more of the facts. And I sit back after looking at that and I'm like, damn, if I were to watch that, clear my, clear my SD card out of my brain. Everything I just learned from that video was almost every plant, out there roller crimp terminates that's not true the one he's standing on is the best one that's not true they just happen to be paying him and that you know for for marketing and advertising probably a hundred grand or more believe it or not and people are running out there and making purchases based on this so anyway yeah I, i i love that you get so fired up every time um somebody plants you know goes with like the uw madison recommendations 100 150 pounds of cereal rye and then they plant corn into it and then to boot we get a drought and they're they're flustered and then of course then you have the group of people who just hammer on them like you know like like they're the nerd in school and it's like let's beat him while he's down instead of saying you know why don't you try this next time (laughs) yeah yeah and i mean in, in my area too everybody's been you know for the last 12, 15 years, it seems like everybody is for, for corn, everybody's pushing for higher populations, higher populations, you know, to get maximum yield, you have to push this population. And so guys are planting 36,000. I mean, we're on organic matters of anywhere from 0.8 to (laughs) 1.8. So let's think about that for a minute. For every 1% organic matter, we'll hold roughly about an acre inch of water. So 27, 28,000 gallons, right? So not not a lot of water holding capacity in our storage tank here. Think about a, a gas tank and where we sit, you know, are, are we living in the slash Kramer? Um, I love that Seinfeld episode. <laughs> but uh, sitting there, and this time of year, we're, we're living in that slash. And we're going to plant 36, 38,000 corn plants per acre out there. And the, the nice thing is, especially when you're in tractor and you're driving over top and you can see across to the top of the cornfields, yeah. you can see how much variability there truly is out in these fields based on the corn that curls up the quickest in the morning. Like by 10 o'clock in the morning, those areas that are curling up the quickest and the fastest have the lowest water holding capacity soils right there. Those are our toughest acres. And yet we're still spending 
way more money on those acres to, for maximum yield when in all reality, those acres are going to give up yield. And if we would actually just pull the population back 10,000 in those areas, we've got 10,000 less plants out there. They're going to be sucking up less water, less nutrients. They're going to maintain a heck of a lot better and potentially have a higher yield. Yeah. I've had a, a client that, you know, farm in the river bottoms and they go from uh, really heavy, mucky soils to, to blow sand. And they're like, on blow sand, we've went to dropping our population down to, to like 15,000 plants per acre. And where we used to raise zero because we just kept it the same, we're raising 50 to 75 bushel an acre. You know, it's not setting the world on fire by any means, but it's maintain. It's actually building our averages because a zero drops you work quicker, right? I mean, heck, if we can't do simple math to understand averages here, what the heck are we doing? Yeah. But yeah. I'm like, why are we putting so much out there? You know, that's that's a big thing that I see this year. It's like we've got to be better managers of of our resource. And and I just saw this on LinkedIn. Somebody commented and it was like if if everybody in the industry planted one thousand less population, that would equal to like a million less bags of corn that the, <laughs> the industry would sell. Like, let's think about that for a minute. What does that do for these companies that are selling corn? That's a huge loss. Maybe it's not a million, maybe it's a hundred thousand. I don't know, but still that's I'd have to figure out the total amount of acres in, in the U S of corn acres. And, and yeah, there's a whole lot going on with that comment. I'd like to go a different direction, but I won't. Mm-hmm. The, 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 what remind you're reminding me of Oak stands. I'm standing in an Oak, uh, a forest stand with, you know, Oaks with a client. It could be anywhere in Oak country, whites and reds. And we're kind of going over the basics. I just wrote a series, a two part column. It won't be, published in peterson's bow hunting until september october september and the october issues but i wrote on the red and white oaks and you know most of our listeners have probably heard it a million times but i'm tired of people telling me that red oaks only produce every other year that's just not true and so anyway i re i, I re-entertain this whole red versus white kind of white and it cracks me up because i'm like listen we're standing in a in an oak stand and they're like no i don't want to cut it and i'm like okay but you just told me you know, you remember years ago when you were a kid or your dad was a kid, this was the best stand to hunt in. Kill deer every time you came here. I'm showing you my densiometer. We can't see the sky, right? The the forest floor is completely, I mean, we could have a football game in here practically and not get in the way of too many trees. And I'm asking them to cut out, you know, X percentage. And they're like, no way. These are my oaks. You know, they take too long to produce and they're, it's aesthetically beautiful. And I'm like, it's kind of like Americans though. Like there's a certain smaller percentage of the population who's actually productive and paying taxes. And there's a big, great, big portion of the population who's not. And in oak trees, like, you know, 30% of the oaks are actually producing the majority of the acorns. So if we get in there and weed a bunch out, and increase the size of each individual crown and this is just kind of an in, you know in a nutshell um spiel about it i'm like man we can produce probably more well certainly more acorns with less trees and capitalize on the fact that we're getting more sunlight to the forest floor which is where we really need the energy and production and below waste you know type early successional habitat not just for deer but turkeys etc and, and then usually we can kind of get over that hump, but it's funny because they don't, they're not willing to cull out a certain number of oaks to have a better situation later. And I understand, I mean, oaks are amazing. You know, it takes generations to produce a, an acorn. So acorn, yeah. acorn, almond, amen, or egg corn. I've heard that one too. Egg corn. That's an old country thing, but anyway, so there's <laughs> that. So, Okay. I want to, since we've, we've, I want to talk about two things really quick. The perennial thing. Um, that's why I created perennial reload and, and variations of perennial reload because perennials are key, but you don't have a perennial doesn't necessarily mean putting it in the ground and leaving it go right. Conventionally perennial food plot management meant this clover, alfalfa, maybe chicory, 
whatever planet. And then the battle begins. The battle of, oh crap, the grasses are coming in. I got to spray them and use a grass specific, cethoxidim, clethodim, whatever. Kill the grasses and have just legumes because that's protein. That's what grows big deer, right? So that still goes on on Facebook. It, it kills me that we're still fighting this battle. The soils are trying to reach a carbon nitrogen ratio. And instead of just giving it to them and, and promoting it and supplementing these perennial plots each spring with a desirable grass that we and, and critters want, they just fight it with more chemical, which is completely asinine. So there's that. The other thing is what can, so we're sitting here now, it's almost July 4th. It's, it's almost July. Um, what in hindsight, looking back, like, okay, I just got punished in having this dry weather. How can, how can a, a food plotter, um, get ahead? It's kind of what I want to sort of close on. How can we get ahead now if we did get punched and in the corner what can we be thinking for the cool season annuals this year? How can we set it up better? Um, cool season annuals in say September or whatever, October going into next year so that we have these, these incredible uh, lush cover crops. And then also, I mean, you can obviously sneak in perennials in the fall is a good time with the cool season and, and, and this uh, rainfall, as long as you get enough time for, for root growth and establishment, et cetera. But, um, you know, like fall nourishment, for instance, I came up with fall nourishment for this reason. Fall reload was like clients going, hey, I'm cool on this soil health thing. I want to rebuild my organic matter, whatever whatever parameter we're looking at, respiration, biology. But don't forget, we've got a 196-year-old this year that we want to kill. And if we don't, well, not if we don't, you're fired, but understand that that's our primary goal, not you know, necessarily just soil health. And then some of the guys took it to heart and they were like, wow, this stuff works. This is incredible. We need to back off a little bit. We do not need, they started to realize we do not need a monoculture stand of radish to kill a buck late season. And we could probably only put five or six pounds or even two pounds of radish in a fall blend and still kill that mature buck. So fall nourishment was that Let's back it off. And most of these guys have a roller crimper sitting at or in the barn. And they were like, listen, I don't need a lot to kill them. I've realized that. But man, next spring, I want something that's going to come back with a vengeance that I can then roller crimp and lead into my, my summer with. And that was the purpose of fall nourishment. So what can they do now after getting beat up a little bit all spring and summer to avoid and, and and listen next year may maybe massive floods and yeah. but the, but the same management generally allows you to be more resilient in a flood as does in a drought oftentimes with obviously game time decision you know things are different somewhat but having plants in the ground and having infiltration and soil aggregates and blah 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 thoughts yes you hit on a lot of things right there and I wish I was taking notes now. So I hope to not miss any of it, but I would say, you know, people that listen to your podcast here are all across the country, North, South, East and West. So we have to look at our growing days and look at when is our first killing frost. And maybe you're in Florida and you don't even know what a frost means, <laughs> but I wish I was right now. <laughs> but you look at that and you have to say, okay, uh, what should I be seeding and when? And for instance, I've got a farmer friend of mine up in Northern Illinois. It's like 10 miles from Wisconsin border. And he, he put weed in his crop rotation so he could get a cover crop ahead of corn established quicker to get that diversity, specifically the legumes. So you're looking at, hey, I want to throw a couple pounds of Nebraska, and by all means, do not go over two pounds total of Nebraska. <laughs> just please do not do that. But two pounds of Nebraska. If I want to do some Nebraskas in there, if I want to do some some clover and some vetch and peas, and throw in some oats because I want to get that fall growth of oats out there, and and maybe some barley or whatever it is, let's get them out there earlier. Five 
every every day in September growth is we equal to five days of October growth. So the earlier we can get that established, maybe that's the end of August, you know, middle of August in, in the far north. Uh, maybe it's the first September. Maybe it's the first of October, you know, but we can get things established earlier and quicker. And we can throw even some of that. Hey, if we're in that August time frame, we, even up by uh, Wisconsin, we still have enough growing degree days that we could throw in a light rate of some warm season annuals into that or mm-hmm. perennials, but a little bit of the the millets is today in grass or forage sorghum, things like that um, to get some growth out there. Yeah, it's going to winter kill, but they're going to eat on that too. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen deer out in soybean plumage or, or corn fields out eating on residue. Uh, like that's just the energy they need, especially when it gets cold. Yeah. And if so, they don't eat it, the microbes will eat it. Yeah. I mean, you, it's building your soil health. It's building it's, the key word you said there was building resilience. And I love the game time decision. I've got so many guys that are like, I got to have a strict plan. I need to know exactly what we're going to do. And I'm like, well, you tell me what the weather's going to do. Yeah. If we're doing this, it's different than any other type of farming. So it takes a lot more management. It takes a lot more boots on the ground, a lot more walking fields. Like I got guys worried about brown stink bugs this year. And just because guys on TikTok and social media are talking about it so bad. I'm like, they're not that bad. Yes, they're out there. But in all honesty, if we stay dry and they take out 20% of your stand, now we're down to where you probably should be. That's 20% less plants that are sucking up moisture. Yeah, you paid for all that seed, but it might help you, you know. Um, It's just things like that that I think about. Uh, But that's, that's where I would go with it is let's plan on what can we seed earlier to get a lot of fall growth into mm-hmm. it plus maintain that we can get earlier spring growth and we can get a lot more spring growth on it if we plant rye late and and typically when we shell corn here we're planting rye up until first of november maybe middle of november and our rye growth is horrible in, in a lot of times compared to that field that gets planted in you know september time yeah. frame so <clears throat> The earlier we can go into that, the more growth we get, the more more vigor that we have, the more uniformity that we have across the field. And that's a great thing right there. Here's another thing I wanted to throw out there is is let's talk about plant nutrition for just a little bit. Yes, the the plants um, interacting with the soil microbes and plants fix dirt. But when we get into these dry situations, and things start shutting down, we're not able to take up some of those nutrients in the plant. Early on in a drought year, this is where foliar feeding can really have a huge benefit. And and if you read the academia and all this stuff, they'll be like, yeah, well, the, the plants don't need any of these tertiary nutrients at a very large ratio. So, you know, do they really benefit you or not? Well, here's the thing. What form are they in? What was the chelate used when they were doing the trials? Did they broadcast a, a pound and a half of of something a zinc sulfate per acre do you think you can accurately spread a pound and a half per acre or did they use it in a liquid suspension and spray it on foliar but where i'm going with this is if you catch that plant early enough in the drought or where it looks like it's dry and you spray foliar nutrition onto that plant it's going to stimulate that plant to release out more root exudates into the soil to attract more of those microbes, to get more of those nutrients into that plant, especially the ones that we just sprayed. And some of those nutrients can help you withstand that drought longer. Yes, yes. More resilience. And that's when yeah. when I came out with Revive, which you know, I sent you a jug or whatever. Mm-hmm. People were like, whoa, wait a minute. <clears throat> inputs. You're like supposed to be cutting inputs and now you're reintroducing inputs. But you got to understand that that we are studying this so far ahead of what we're introducing products for. And I had obviously learned a lot from you and done a lot of research and found that obviously that the podcast with Don Huber should be <clears throat> an eye opener for a lot of people in that you can dump any form of nutrient in the ground. If you have a chelation effect with glyphosate or, you know, any other actual chemical that binds to those nutrients 
the plant can't use it. It is, it's not bioavailable. So I started looking into foliar nutrition, really for my citrus grove in Florida, which they've destroyed down there. <clears throat> and I was like, wow, this is, this is great stuff, but it's got to be chelated. Like, like our revive is chelated uh, to amino acids, which are highly sought after, obviously, by all living things, including plants. So it's a, it's a source that they want. And that's what we need to do. And I'm just, I'm just curious because <clears throat> this was the first year I offered it commercially. And what I saw was super amazing, not just in what you're saying, the more efficient root exudates or exudation, um, but just gaining that solar, uh, all these solar panels bound, p- popping up. I'm, I like to remind people that solar panels are plants. That's what a solar panel is. We increase the photosynthetic activity of those plants by staying ahead of the curve with Revive. If we hit it too late, we, we didn't see as much of a, a benefit. So I'm, I'm curious. I actually haven't really get, had the chance to talk to you about what, you've, what you saw with Revive. And I know you test a lot of products that are similar or you know, maybe not similar. So yeah, what, what else? What did you see from that this year? Um, so we just... We're wrapping up wheat harvest right now, and it's that product has been pretty consistent about ten to fifteen bushel advantage. And if it sucks, you can say it sucks. No, I, I mean, and I will say it did depend on rain. Yes, and it also depended on okay, if we're going to build all this, do we have enough of the base with it as well? You know, um, the other thing is is that. In agriculture and farming, everything is just farming, like I mentioned earlier, gardening, whatever. We focus on the big three, NPK. And if we were to build a pyramid, we'd put NPK as the primary at top. We'd put the calcium and sulfur, magnesium in the middle. Those are secondary. And and then we'd put all others in the treasury, you know, Mm -hmm. micronutrients don't need a lot at the very bottom. And saying, well, we need these big three up here and then the secondary. So that's what we got to focus on. Well, we really need to flip that upside down because it's those micronutrients that regulate all of the macronutrients in that plant. Totally agree. Whether it's nutrient uptake, the diffusion into the soil, um, the plant root interception, uh, the microbial interactions in that soil, all of it is mediated if you were to look at that cell and go back to high school biology you know and and think about what is happening in that cell structure of that plant and it's all revived it revolves around the energy from the sun but then we have to have all these different nutrients that interact and create different enzyme activities and everything think of like the glues to build it all together Mm -hmm. basically glues and and nails and screws and leg screws and, and bolts and nuts that's what that's what we're doing with all these micronutrients is we're putting all it all together so then we can have more of these solar panels out there. We have more leaves, we have bigger leaves. Uh, yeah, one guy that uh, we spread some on, uh, sprayed some of that revive on some corn and looking at um, treated versus untreated. Visually, you couldn't see a difference, and, and this was probably two weeks ago, and it was in in eastern part of Missouri, um, kind of between Hannibal and, and, yep. uh, yep. Louis. and so visually we we're like, okay, you really can't see a difference. And I said, well, let's, let's take, do this. We've got both the same leaf nodes up here. So we're both the same stage. So let's take the upper leaf from both sides and let's compare them. Oh shit. It was a quarter inch wider and, and probably three inches longer. Wow. Think of how much, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you extrapolate that across a field, think about how much more sunlight you're grabbing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, man, you start thinking about all of these nutrient interactions and, and most guys think about Liebig's law of the minimum, but we've got to be looking at the law of the maximum too. Yes. And, and understanding that if we have too much of a nutrient, it could be antagonistic to other nutrients. So we need to look at the molders chart, yep. pay attention to that and understand nutrient interactions, the synergisms and the antagonisms in that plant. I've seen already universities out here talking about tar spot was found in Missouri 
and and oh my gosh we gotta be spraying fungicide and i've had guys calling me oh my god we need to be spraying fungicide and i mm. said did you manage your nutrients in season no because i didn't I've, i tried that before and i didn't see a response i said well what did you apply did you do a tissue test well no so you went out there with the shotgun put a blindfold on spun around three times and then shot and thought you were going to hit the donkey in the ass yes like let's use a rifle approach let's easy, and, now, and now it's easy button time yeah, oh God, yeah. Let's hit it with a fungicide. And and I'm like, the research has already been done by several agronomists I know that have, that have identified, and I think Huber was on this too. I know Huber was. Um, looking at nutrients with tar spot yeah. and, and found out that the plants that were most susceptible to tar spot had low potassium and low manganese. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, potassium and manganese have a... A synergistic relationship and that's what manganese helps regulate the potassium in the plant so if we can spread all the potash that we want potassium chloride but potassium chloride only has less than 10 percent absorption yes yep. so we spread 200 pounds of, of kcl to get 120 pounds of potassium i think that's enough for our corn that's enough for our soybeans whatever and yet we're only getting 12. Mm-hmm. We could spray a potassium acetate and get 45 to 50% absorption yeah. at a gallon. So we're getting more of that in the plant. Maybe it's the same pounds per acre, but then that plant, just like the amino acids in, in the micronutrients, and, and it could be an EDTA chelate too, those chelates can go out through the root system and can bind up other nutrients. So an EDTA and EDDA or EDDHA, they can bind up other nutrients in that, that soil so then the plant can't take it up. Well, the acetate, think about this for a second. They test potassium on a standard soil test using ammonium acetate. So it's the acetate that is making that potassium available. So when we're releasing those acetates out of the root system we're all of a sudden releasing potassium out of the soil and by the way there's 97 percent of the ac or the the potassium in our soils we don't even measure so i mean there's more potassium in our soils than we'll ever yeah all right that's enough because that's a future podcast <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i've been wanting to do that one for a while that's yeah good okay that is good stuff no that that all it's funny what well, it was not funny but um you know, the, the universities in Florida um, in, in getting in bed with the chemical companies and the input companies have completely destroyed and exported. It's sad, actually, and very frustrating because some of my friends and clients and just just overall peers down that way um, are, are citrus growers. But everything you've talked about, the Molders chart and, you know, throwing out Liebig a little bit for a while and thinking, flipping it upside down and and just looking at the relationship and the ratios and the chelation and the way they've managed citrus is absolutely disgusting. And if you think eating an orange is is always healthy for you, you're just flat ignorant as to what the facts are. Fortunately, we have people like like Uncle Matt's Organic in Florida um, who, and full disclaimer, they called me and purchased an ST1 because, you'll love this, they're getting into, well, they've been into Soul Health, they're organic, um, and they've been planting cover crops in the middles and no chemicals, obviously organic in the, in the rows. And they're just kicking ass as far as I'm concerned. So you can, you can imagine where my oranges and uh, orange juice comes from based on how they're managing uh, their, their food. So anyway, man, I wanted to do under an hour on this. I appreciate yeah, here we your time. Are. I know we're, this is this gives the listener uh, an opportunity to hear what we talk about and geek out on, um, and and I had fifteen or twenty different directions I wanted to go based on your last comment. But the one thing I realized when I started looking at the foliar nutrition is that wow, we've done far more dis- damage and exportation of fertility from our soils than I ever imagined. I never knew until I got to really focusing on soils just how bad it is at some point we're going to have to reintroduce fertility to get anywhere 
And that's, mm-hmm. that's when you start to look at, you know, chelated um, products and options. And they're just, they're far more bioavailable. They may cost sometimes a little bit more on the front end, but like you said, they're actually improving the fertility a lot quicker, allowing us to get to a higher photosynthetic conversion, but more importantly, bigger antlers. Cause that's more important than any of this garbage is bigger antlers, higher lactation rates, higher bat body fat, less CWD. And by the way, I'm going to close on a CWD fact. I've been talking to clients where this, where chronic wasting disease jumped and initially started. Let's just throw out Wisconsin as an example, certainly not alone. And those clients who have been managing properly their properties properly, but by that I'm talking from a systems approach, holistic approach, and even some conventional, you know, food plotting that we're now transitioning to regenerative food plotting. They are reporting far bigger bucks, far healthier deer, and far better deer hunting than they've ever had. So it goes with my theory that chronic wasting disease, COVID-19, all of this stuff, it's just nature, man. Relax. I know it's a moneymaker for a lot of people, including academics who seek grants and funding, the government who seeks patents that we don't even know about for vaccines, et cetera. It's nature. The end of our deer hunting is not coming. The only thing that's going to end our deer hunting is mismanagement by the bipedal man, hominids, two-legged human beings. That's it. So I just thought I'd report that. I think what you're going to see here in the next couple of years or a few years, because people are really slow. If you watched COVID and followed the masking stuff and the lockdowns and the vaccines, it's all been a disaster, a complete disaster. What you're going to see on chronic wasting disease, some of the experts, and I'm doing my air quotes, some of the experts will start, to, if, if they have any, uh, well, ethical moral standards they'll start to walk back some of this stuff about cwd you know basically increasing in prevalence oh no we need to have more podcasts about killing more deer and sharpshooting more deer and and creating vaccines for free-ranging deer they're going to start to slowly walk back a couple of them have already been slapped by the true experts in cwd um, so yeah, just, just a report. I've, I've been wanting to do a deep dive on CWD. Obviously I have been, it takes an, ama- an enormous amount of time and a massive amount of hours talking to collecting and trying to get to the truth. So I just wanted to, to float that out there because I, it came, came to my mind, but man, anything else about drought? And then I think we should shut this yeah. off and I, I was thinking about one thing just now and it didn't have anything to do with CWD. I was literally just, my mind went you're blank. Not, you're not going back to middle school girls again, are you? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, I, I was looking across here and I looked at a wheat field on yeah. wheat fields over that had been harvested. And I got to thinking about last week it was dry. Guys were harvesting wheat. I mean, they weren't even predicting this rain. And the amount of double crop soybeans that were being planted was insane. Meanwhile, everyone was complaining about being too dry for their, their first crop beans. <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck do you guys think? Why don't you plant a cover crop? Because one, most guys are out of hay. You could at least sell it for a forage or graze it or, or at least use it for a soil building primer instead of like planting a double crop soybean and not getting the yield off of it. Out, yeah. But here's the thing is that crop insurance now allows them to insure those double crop soybeans yeah. they don't insure a cover crop yep. so we can spend twenty dollars on a mix a cheap blend to go after corn or after wheat to to build the primer uh soil or we can spend you know 30 40 bucks on soybeans plus the uh, the herbicides needed because even even as dry as it is we still get weeds that want to grow yes Absolutely. It's a racket, meaning it's a money-making scheme, and there's a lot of them out there. And that's why I get so irritated when a state or federal, no offense to the good ones, there are great ones, employee goes to one of my client properties and counter counters everything that that we're doing because of an invasive or noxious weed. It just cracks me up. They are in the tank with so many different niches of people and and it really should be ecological function. It should be feeding human beings nutrient dense, healthy foods, minus all the garbage that they're spraying on it. With that, man, I think 
all of this will allow the listener to really refocus on what drought, what flood, um, you know, what what cold winters, mild winters can mean to a system that is built around resilience and functionality and a systems approach. So, man, I appreciate you. The 4th of July is coming up. To me, that's the greatest the greatest holiday of all because without freedom, um, and for me, it's just a reminder of freedom, and we're going to go raise some hell and have fun. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and as always, man, I Real quick, appreciate it. Go ahead. Before you hang up on me here, always remember that what follows the night, the sun shines. The sun comes up every morning, right? And at the end of the day, follows the night. And at the end of a drought, it always starts raining at some point in time. <laughs> and at the end of a flood, it stops raining at some point in time. Don't give up hope. That's all I'm saying. And and to that point, nature is is about averages. And although we live to be a hundred years old, if we're lucky, a warming period over a few thousand is not global warming. A cooling period, which they were preaching when I was born, over a few thousand years is not cooling, global cooling. It's just the way Earth is. Yeah. We need to be more resilient, focus on how we manage our farms, our properties, our fields, whatever, so that we can handle those periods, those excess periods, which are just nature. It's just how nature and the Earth works. Suck it up. Get rid of the cheats. And I agree with you. Um, in fact, we went from super dry to, holy crap, when's it going to stop raining? And my fields look amazing. The biology's thriving. The sun is shining today. And, uh, and we're back at growing deer food, which, again, is the most important thing of all. And now you can have big fireworks. Yes, absolutely. All right, buddy. Hey, let, let's do it again. I can't wait to get that, that long... Uh, forum podcast out on crimping because your segment was was a blast to do and we pointed out a lot of intricate uh, contextual differences on the roller crimper and uh, super excited about that so anyway man happy fourth have fun yep. and uh, thanks for coming on yeah, thank you yep. all right i'm gonna wrap it up real quick no long outro just want to uh myself wish everybody a happy fourth again i do think it's an extremely important holiday it comes during a great time of the year um just wanted to mention again that uh with the fall coming up for most of us david mentioned it depending on where you're at where you're at geographically planting a little earlier with your cool seasons um, whether it's cereal rye, hairy vetch, winter peas, we, we get all that, we plant all that, or fall nourishment, uh, fall reload, get them in the ground a little earlier, and I think you'll see a benefit next year. Thank you for listening, and happy 4th of July.